Hey, welcome to the Complete Advisor. We are uh, in luck. We are joined uh, by our friend Jonathan Lee. Jonathan, great to have you here on the show today. Great to be here. Uh, so, for those that don't know Jonathan, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your practice? Because we've got the pleasure of working with you for years, uh, but a little, little short bio. Sure. So, I've been in practice since 1996, so a few years now. And I run a practice in suburban Maryland, and we focus mostly on uh, federal employees. And we have been um, just recently expanding out nationwide now because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, we did everything in person a few years back, including our our educational workshop events. And we switched to 100% virtual. So now everything is, yeah, everything is purely webinar based. We run maybe 25 to 30 webinars per month out of our office all across the country, and now my clients are scattered about, and I can wear Hawaiian shirts and flip-flops to work every day. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. One of the things I did want to talk to you about uh, is mentoring, because mm-hmm. you're here in Kansas City. Um, today, you're doing, and I'm so glad you're here, and I'm so glad I bumped into you this morning. <laughs> um, you're doing an Elite Advisor Academy, and you do a ton of mentoring, and then you do a ton of, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you still do a ton of um, joint work. Yes, yeah. And so, you know, over the years, there's two things that I've told people in my trainings. I said, number one, this is a very lonely business. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people are on islands, and, you know, if something happens, you know, there's not a lot of people that necessarily have your back, other than, like, like your relationship with, with creative and, mm-hmm. and you guys, stuff like that. But other than that, it's a very lonely thing for the advisors. So I really like to engage other advisors. You know, I've visited over 40 different advisors' offices. I've done joint work with advisors. I've learned a lot from other people. And that's something that also keeps me interested. And I've formed relationships with a lot of these guys. And we travel the world together and our wives hang out. And it's just really cool. The second part is this business doesn't do a lot for people who are intellectually curious. So mm-hmm. over time, it's very repetitive. And, you know, a lot of guys in this business, you know, they get successful and they might get a little bit complacent, lazy, and sit back and enjoy the ride. And that's perfectly fine. But I'm not like that. I need to just be learning and I need to be creative and I need to be doing things. So by working with other advisors, my gosh, I've learned about so many different markets and so many different things that I never would have known if I just stayed in my little box. And now every single week in my office, our staff... Um, you know, we do uh, initiatives where we try new things and, and try to be creative with things. And we, we waste a ton of time and money doing this. However, once in a while, something works. And when it works, and we, then we pilot it, and, and it's bona fide successful, then we can introduce other people to it and let them know that we've vetted it, and it works, and they can reap the benefits as well. So it's a, it's a nice thing. Okay, I have to put you on the spot. Yeah. Give us, what's an example? <laughs> so this is a great, yeah. So I'm not into Medicare at all. Okay. Right. And I can tell you right now, it's like I was telling one of these guys, one of these older advisors said, you know, the Medicare market's kind of interesting because um, every single person's a prospect. Mm-hmm. Right. Every single person, rich, poor, whatever. Yeah. Um, and he's like, no interest, no interest in Medicare. I said, well, wait a minute. I just met a guy that came to my office, flew to Maryland, did an in-person Medicare webinar um, that I drove, tra- that actually I had you guys drive traffic to. Mm-hmm. He scheduled... St- in a matter of two days, he scheduled 75 appointments. Wow. And in the first day, so what's happened with the Medicare guy is he writes the Medicare. Good for him. I don't want to write the Medicare, right? He meets with everybody, writes the Medicare, and then he says, oh, by the way, um, you got a million bucks in your retirement account. You know this is taxable, right? I'm going to have you meet with Jonathan. He's going to show you how to save money on taxes. Mm-hmm. Then he schedules the follow-up meeting for me the next week. And I get to have this client where I'm kind of teed up as the expert and, and expectations are set. And... Um, worked great. So guess what we're doing? We're saying, hey, you know what? Even if you're not interested in Medicare, I would strongly consider doing a marketing event where either Medicare or maybe even Social Security um, is the topic and the advisor shouldn't do it. You should have the expert in that area do it and then they will vet and, I don't know, kind of bird dog cases and send them to the advisor and just pick the cherry cases for you. I think this might lead to a better life for some people. Yeah, I think that, I, you know, I, I know from personal experience that there's a, a little bit of a bias mm-hmm. when it comes to thinking about working working in and with Medicare yeah. like that. But you're right, everybody, this is something that's going to touch everybody. Yeah, and the Medicare, I'm not, like the Medicare producers, I find, have pigeonholed themselves. 
Mm-hmm. And so, like, if you're really great at Medicare, it's hard for you to be really great at other things, and it's hard for people to take you seriously in other areas. Yep. And, not, and not just, like, health insurance guys do this. Sometimes even in mortgage brokers, you know, everybody in their field, if they're really good, fantastic. But it's unlikely that clients will take your advice in other places. I've, I've heard people try to cross-sell, for example, PNC agents try to cross-sell yep. life insurance. It just, it just doesn't work. But if you have the expert in this area identify a problem or a need, and then they tee you up as the expert and refer them over to you, I think that recipe is going to be very successful. Very nice. Something you're going to explore in the new year. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the, f- the first day after this workshop, um, the guy that ran it mm-hmm. had seven meetings. We, of the 75, he had seven on that first Monday. He called me. He's like, I've identified $2 million for you to roll over today. Nice. And I said, that, that's a good day. And, this is, and so when you're doing that, this, these are virtual then too? Uh, yeah, 100% virtual. <laughs> well, how does that work? Okay, so um, I do want to go back into mentoring because you sure, you I'm do sorry. that yeah. all the time. No, no, no. Um, but how do you do the mentoring? How does that work with the, in the virtual world? So we had like right now, um, I think we've got what fifteen ish people mm-hmm. here that to see you and, and go through the Elite Advisor program. Um, so how does that? Where does that go from there? So yeah, it's it's a, it's a full virtual mentorship, and so we do trainings every single Wednesday for mm-hmm. the people in our program. And it's mostly, um, you know, case studies and um, some marketing stuff. But a lot of the mentorship has to do with the joint events. So we'll do a webinar together with the advisor. So advisors, some of them are really great at speaking. Some of them are not so great. Um, some of them have a process. Some of them don't. But we, I think, have really nailed down our process, like every single step of our process. Using your stuff, right, we have the the confirms. We have the scheduling the appointments. We have the setting up of the event. We have the... The, the survey that the people are given at the event, we have the follow-up of the event, um, how everything is positioned is really, really crucial. So we'll do a joint event with the advisors uh, as often as they'd like, and then we'll also do joint cases with the advisors. So a client came to me, and or the, excuse me, an advisor came to me and said, hey, I've got a client selling a restaurant, and they're selling a restaurant for $3.5 million, and the capital gain tax is going to be X, Y, Z. So, you know, we do a lot of those types of transactions where we'll throw the money into a charitable trust, avoid the tax. Sure. So, you know, we'll do it with the client. And if this client happened to be in Boston, um, said, hey, you know, I've got a guy who specializes in avoiding capital gains taxes on these types of events with a special type of trust. I'm going to have you meet with him. His name is Jonathan. I get online. And because of the technology, Mm -hmm. um, again, it just makes sense. And I think people are really appreciative of that. So... Um, joint work and mentorship has really not missed a beat at all since since things are virtual. You know, it's funny. I I, I was curious about the about working with clients virtually, but I have had the pleasure of being on your training calls mm. and listening to. I, I really did enjoy. I haven't been on one in a while, but I have memory of awesome uh, casework where you would bring up a case or somebody you would take somebody in a group would submit a case to you, mm-hmm. and you would walk through with the group how and what should be done or what would be the right way to go. And those were pretty doggone effective. Yeah. And like I said, I'm not a master of technology, but once you just get online, you do the screen share, mm-hmm. it's it's just what the times are sort of calling for. People are like expecting you to be knowledgeable at that kind of stuff. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's a good fit. There, they seem to be um, two things that I noticed over the, through the course of the pandemic was one, it, it felt like um, maybe, maybe this is the wrong way to say it, but like attention's bands were a little short. Just get to the point. That was one thing I noticed people really want to get to the point. Um, the other thing is people seem a lot more forgiving of technology than they did <laughs> years ago. Oh, and the third observation, my parents are in their 80s and they're on their iPads. So like yeah. everybody, there was, a, I remember seeing an early bias of, well, my clients aren't going to be able to, to do this or get there. And it's like, yeah, you know, the bias might be yours because they're, they're, they're already there. Yeah. So the second point you made about being forgiving about technology is totally true because mm-hmm. it's not always reliable. And, yeah, sometimes it messes up. Um, and that's the other reason why I can do everything just sort of from memory and I can do everything manual. I can do the manual calculations that we use. Mm-hmm. Calculators nowadays to solve things. I can just do them. Sure. It's important. To, it's, it's important to know how to do that stuff and how to learn. I, I can, if you're a federal employee, I can calculate your pension in my head, for example. If you're a teacher, I can calculate your pension, and people are impressed by that. Um, but I will say, kind of like the the island thing I was talking about for advisors, we have definitely noticed that the general population that we have as clients are a little bit lonely and scared too, and they definitely like to chat. They want to talk about what's going on. They're maybe nervous or scared, and they want reassurance. Um, we've noticed that a lot more. And a lot of what we actually just do is reassure them and let them know things are going to be okay. And that's 
picked up a lot. We didn't do that as much in person, and I feel like we're doing a lot more of that virtually. That's interesting. That's a really interesting observation. Because um, you're right, well, ad- advisors. It is a it is a little it's a lonely business because mm-hmm. you are out there. You can't really talk to the you know. You can have some friends in your same town, but you're talking to your competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and you're probably never. I remember. I remember. You know, somebody would ask how things are. Oh, it's great. You know, sales are great. <laughs> no matter you know, what. No matter what. <laughs> yeah. Go around the corner and start crying. Uh, you'd never admit. You'd never admit to another advisor that things. You know, I'm running through a little, uh, little <laughs> dull patch here or whatnot. But yeah. um, never really thought about that with consumers. But we everybody society has kind of isolated, and people are maybe a little, not standoffish, but more wary. Yeah, yeah, and I, I really believe that people, because we do so much education in the webinars, they, they hear my voice. So I, I can talk to a client I've never heard before, and they get on the phone and they say, oh, gosh, you're, I feel like we know each other. Like, they feel like I'm family because they've, they've heard me give, like, seven presentations online. Yeah. So they know my voice immediately, and they feel like they know me. And that's, that actually cuts down on the whole relationship building process, I think. Is it easier with is it easier doing um, virtual to keep a close eye on your client acquisition costs or your your ROI on on what you're spending to to acquire new clients or is I, it the same? Yeah, it's just, I don't think it matters virtual versus in person for that. Mm-hmm. But as you were pointing out earlier, it's the efficiency. I can do way more meetings now, and even before, like when I had to drive to go do an in person workshop. Yeah. I had to prepare before, drive there, do the workshop, come back. That took half my day. Mm-hmm. I can do three live presentations a day now and mm-hmm. still have extra time to go out and eat lunch. I mean, yeah. I never even thought, you know, I didn't even, you're out in, uh, you guys have real traffic out there. We do. Yeah. We still do, yeah. <laughs> we have, Kansas City, we kind of have baby traffic, yeah. uh, For even though we're a good-sized metro now. But um, getting that amount of time back, or if you're, for a client, just not having to, like, I really want to see that or I want to attend that, but I don't want to drive across town, put pants on and Absolutely. park. Yeah, our attendance at our webinars is, is very, very high, and we would get a tiny little fraction of that if they had to come somewhere in person. And, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. What about, uh, uh, talk a little bit about, you've got a foundation. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so our foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit, and I think – Based upon what I've seen out there, we're the only one that really runs as a true nonprofit, meaning we can take tax-deductible donations, we do charitable work, we give money back to the community, we do a lot of different things. Even though the basis of our foundation is education and, and financial education, um, in our community we do a lot of other, like, for example, during the pandemic we were giving $1,000 tips to um, local wait staff and restaurant oh, tours. Cool. Yeah. And so we would raise, like, whenever somebody gave us money, we don't need money for our budget. So we would just give that back. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of clients because we're a foundation. Uh, even even though they might have done business with us, they just sent us checks as, as a thank you. And they feel like, you know, guilty because we spent four meetings with them, an hour piece. Like, we want to help support you guys. So uh, we did get quite a bit of money in donations. And it was really fun figuring out ways. And we sort of had like an employee of the week in our office, and that employee got to decide who he gave the money to. Oh, that's really and nominate cool. people, and it was gratifying. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, let's uh, let me ask you a couple questions. Let's put on your Punxsutawney Phil hat here. Uh, what do you see? So we're sitting here heading into the fall, or actually maybe is today the first day of fall. We're pretty close. We're pretty close. Where do we pass it? It's right. It's right around here. We just yeah. Um, so as you look towards the the rest of the year, as you look towards next year. What uh, what trends excite you? What do you see that's of interest? Anything scare you? Well, so the the world is opening back up, mm-hmm. and so we're going to be putting um, a mix of live in person events now. We just have to because mm-hmm. people are itching to get out and yep. they want to meet people. But I'm not the one that's doing them. I'm going to have other people do them. So I feel like the world opening back up after this pandemic is really going to get people back into like the real world and society. Um, one negative trend that I've noticed is I've had a lot of trouble um, with people's um, underwriting for insurance right now. Really? Yeah. So our, our, our firm is heavily, heavily life insurance based. Mm-hmm. And I've definitely noticed, and it concerns me, though, I've noticed a big trend where it's harder to underwrite cases now. And the long-term care products, like the um, asset-based long-term care products, yeah. they're, they're getting repriced fairly regularly. So it's something that's adding an extra element of something that we really need to stay on top of um, to do this. But because of the I mean, because obviously the volatility of the market uh-huh. and because of inflation and all this other nuts stuff that's going on in the world, people need us way more. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm this is prob- I'm, I'm guessing based upon what you guys have been telling me of your success and what we've seen, this is our best time ever. 
Yeah. This is the biggest opportunity, and I've been doing this for 25 years. This is the biggest opportunity that we've ever seen to acquire new clients and, and collect more premium because people are, are they getting older, right? They're tired of doing it themselves. They may have health issues, but they certainly are realizing, oh my gosh, I can't do this myself. Yeah. You know, and this reality check that people are getting has been incredibly helpful for what we do. I think the inflation reality check has got to be a, a big eye opener for a lot of people. Yeah. So one, one of the Medicare uh, points that we make in the workshop is, you know, Medicare Part B premium. And by the way, mm-hmm. before last week, I knew nothing about Medicare, like literally nothing. Well, Medicare Part, Part B premium is $171 a month if you make a certain amount of money. Um, and just last year or two years ago, it was $140 a month. Mm. In 1985, it was $15 a month. So these people that are paying these Medicare premiums, uh, some of my clients pay $340 a month because their mm-hmm. income's a little bit higher. It's only like $250,000 of income makes your premium way higher. Well, how do you budget for something that could quadruple or quintuple in cost yeah. in retirement like that? It's, it's definitely an unknown that people don't I, know. Yeah. I, I really think that's one that... Um, you know, we always talk. I've seen a million presentations where mm. you, you have inflation listed in there. And, you know, people look at that and he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah. You know, okay, sure, it's going to go up. I think some of the, like, some of the prices, not to pick on my wife, but she doesn't necessarily pay attention to <laughs> to the price of things. She, she just lives and she's a nurse, she just does her thing. And uh, she's even noticed. So the so yeah. the Paula indicator says Paula that indicator. It, that says that inflation is a real issue. But it's fascinating because we talk about that, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, it's gonna go up. And I remember when I was a kid, and I could go to the movies for three bucks. Right. But now it's like, when you go to when you go to do something, you're like, holy smokes. Yeah, it's a big deal. And I yeah. think the number one area that people are concerned about in retirement is the escalation of health costs. So mm-hmm. your wife, as a nurse, she knows about mm-hmm. that for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it really kind of leads into discussion about long-term care and planning for elder care and stuff like that. It's, it's actually been a very good icebreaker. Mm-hmm. And people maybe before weren't concerned about, oh, I've got a million bucks in my retirement account. I'll self-insure. <laughs> well, no, you won't. Because after you take your RMDs, right, a million bucks is probably going to fa- stay fairly stagnant. And you shoot for 20 years, a million bucks will pay for two years worth of care. And then you leave your wife with nothing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these conversations are much more real and and potentially helpful for us. I've got to ask you. So you you hit my curiosity button here. Mm. Um, Going back to life insurance, why do you think uh, underwriting is getting harder or taking longer? Is it COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So there have been very, very few things that have actually changed mortality tables over the last 50 years for insurance companies. So there was an opioid pandemic that, that started to actually move the needle for life expectancy calculations, uh, but those were all younger people. Mm-hmm. Now we have this this pandemic of, of unknown uh, long-term effects. Yeah. And so when people have other ailments, I, I know for a fact that insurance companies just don't know, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't love dealing with the unknowns. So if people have COPD, is this going to make them die sooner? Yeah. Is it going to lead to other things? And so they've been very hesitant. Um, if I have healthy clients, no problem at all. They've been flying through. But when I have clients that have like sort of ailments or multiple ailments where I usually we're able to get them through, it's mm-hmm. definitely been more of a challenge. I've had to make some calls, pull out some personal favors, that kind of thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jeez, I hate to be the guy who invited you, and I, I left my – got to throw my phone on the floor. <laughs> um, it's embarrassing. That, but that's – you know, that is fascinating because, you know, they, the, the talk of, you know, the comorbidities or, you know, taking care of yourself and and so there now it's popping into the now it's popping into our world yeah and the silver lining of this of course is hey you know if you're this is the line i use if if i'm meeting with a client i say what we've noticed with people over the years is they typically don't get younger or healthier Mm -hmm. so if we're going to look at insurance plans i'm feeling like there's a high likelihood that there's going to be an overhaul of premiums and they'll be going up so if if there's time now to, to deal with it we probably should address it yeah now, not they, they may be not getting younger or healthier, but better looking. <laughs> yeah, as like you older. and I. Yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Guys get to get more distinguished. <laughs> That's, this is true. This is true. You and I with our whites, yeah. Uh, so so uh, with that being said, um, what do you see for you? What's what's coming on the horizon? You know, thanks, thanks for asking that. Um, I am just looking for things to keep me interested. And one of the ways I do that is engaging with other advisors. And I'm, I've gotten pretty good at helping people solve problems. Mm-hmm. So that's the one way to really, you know, help the clientele is, you know, identify their problems and solve it. And now I'm trying to figure out advisors' problems. Yeah. And, you know, there's not that many different kinds of advisors. So I figure if I can solve a problem, I can probably, 
you know, replicate that solution and offer it to a lot of other people. I know what my problems are. And my problems are really, really good. I mean, I'm blessed to have them. But honestly, my problems are just how to deal with the volume of business and mm-hmm. make sure that we close stuff and track it in a, in a good way and make sure that we keep really, really good, um, you know, dripping campaigns going on and, and new webinars going on for our clients so we get incoming requests for meetings and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I think exit strategies are the big big deal now. So clients' exit strategies are, well, how do you get money out of your retirement account without paying mm-hmm. taxes? Well, the advisor strategy are, what happens to my practice if I die or retire or what am I going to do? You know, and, and, even, and even in the AUM world, it's, it's a ridiculously small amount of money that people get for their lifetime's worth of work. You know, these factors are ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to find a better way for a win-win where an advisor can make more money off of either selling their practice or passing it on, and the people that can take over it can grow that practice and be there for their clients, mm-hmm. which is what a lot of people care about, and, and maybe even bring those practices to different levels that couldn't have been done originally. That's, you know, that, that's an area that we're looking really heavy at is, uh, you know, not only, not only getting people to look at their practice as a business. Because mm-hmm. really advisors, you know, when you think about it, they're, they're small business owners. They are on the true entrepreneur, but a lot of them never look at their practice that way. And then, uh, but then how do you build the building of equity yeah. in your practice? What can you look and do and, and change to? It, it's a great question. So traditionally, yeah. the only equity, only equity has been recurring revenue. Yep. But we now have found ways to get recurring revenue in five or six different ways. So not just AUM uh, dollars, but yep. like, you know, we have services that we provide now that, you know, clients will need us to keep their, you know, we, we do things like family foundations, for example. Mm-hmm. But when somebody hires us to do that, they need to hire us to not just create it, but to keep it in compliance. What is it? What is what? A family foundation. Oh, so a family foundation is just a way for people to have their estates be transferred to a nonprofit without having taxation Mm -hmm. for for the most part. And they can control sort of how their money is given away and utilized after they're gone. Um, In a perfect world, if they have kids or family, um, we can actually set up a 501c3 nonprofit and have their kids run it for them. So the client maintains control. But when the client dies, they know that, you know, there's a thing called a QCD which I think a lot of people know about. It's called a qualified charitable distribution, but mm-hmm. nobody does it, mm-hmm. right? They don't move money from their IRAs to these 501c3s or charities. But what we've found is if you show a client, hey, you're taking an RMD now that you don't really need, you can actually satisfy the RMD by a QCD into a nonprofit. You can create that nonprofit and have one of your kids run it or have somebody you know, you know, that you care about run that thing after you're gone and leave a legacy you know, hopefully for many, many generations, and most people never knew these things were possible. Yeah. Okay, I hate to do this because I know that I only had a limited amount of time, and I just checked my clock. I, I did a subtle glance. You, hopefully, you didn't notice that I was trying to be <laughs> trying to be sly. All right, Jonathan, have a great weekend. Thanks for being here on the show, and, and uh, I look forward to getting you back on. Always. Thanks for having me. This podcast is for financial professional use only, and not for use with the general public. The information provided is the exclusive property of Creative One and is protected by copyright and other intellectual property laws of the United States. This material has been prepared for informational and educational purposes only. It is not intended to provide, and should not be relied upon for, accounting, legal, tax or investment advice. Creative One is not responsible for the results of programs discussed on this podcast or any liability stemming from the use of it. Although we may promote or recommend the services offered by this company, agents are ultimately responsible for the use of any materials or services and agree to comply with the compliance requirements of their broker-dealer and registered investment advisor, if applicable, and the insurance carriers they represent. Copyright 2022, Creative One Marketing Corporation.